sexually dimorphic females in the Hawaiian dam supply megalagrish palatine. Um, a central question of evolutionary biology is how variation is generated and maintained. And one of the most striking and easiest to study forms of variation is polymorphism. So there's been a lot of productive work studying how polymorphisms are arise and then are maintained within populations. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, female polymorphisms. These are very common in odonates, especially damselflies. There are hundreds of species, and many of them have been studied very thoroughly um, by some people here in this room. Um, this is a species of Ishnera. And in both pictures, there's a male at the top reaching around and holding onto a female in what's called tandem females reaching out to receive sperm from them. You'll see that the males are the same color, they're both a very bright green, but one female is a bright blue and one female is a pretty drab tan. So the female that's more like the male is called the andromorph, and the female that's distinctly different from the male is called the gynomorph. And like I said, there's been a lot of work on this polymorphism and ones like it in related species. And there have been a couple um, good hypotheses as to how this arises. But the root of it is sexual conflict, specifically sexual conflict over the mating rate. Male harassment of females, because their selection for males to mate more than theirs for females, can impede female foraging and <coughs> position. So they can't feed or lay their eggs. So there's selection for females to avoid this harassment for males. And there are two major ways that this could happen and lead to dimorphism. The first is male mimicry. So this is where you have a male over on the left and then these two different types of females. And the gynomorph, the sort of distinct female morph, could be recognized as a female and therefore harassed. But the andromorph that looks like a male might not be recognized as a female, so she might not be harassed by the male. So this would mean that there's more severe harassment on the gynomorphs than on the endomorphs, and this leads to dimorphism. But it could also happen that males sort of get used to the females that are around and they learn to recognize their mates based on the females that they've seen. So if these are two different populations, in the one on the left, where there are a lot of gynomorphs, males will recognize the gynomorphs as potential mates and harass them and not the endomorphs. In the population on the right, where there are a lot of endomorphs, males might learn to recognize those endomorphs as potential mates and harass the endomorphs, but not the gynomorphs. So what we expect if this is going on is that the common morph, whichever it is, will be harassed more than the rare morph. This is negative frequency dependent selection because the effect that color has on fitness depends on the frequency of that color in the population. So the, the um, system that I work in is megalagrian califia. As you can see, unless you're red, green, colorblind, in which case I just want to apologize for the whole rest of this talk. <laughs> the, uh, the males are bright red, and the females are either red, those are the animals, or green, the gynomorphs. So this is different colors, but it's the same pattern that we saw in the previous damselflies. So the obvious question is, okay, the pattern is the same, is the underlying process the same? So that's what I'm asking. Is female color in this system under selection for male harassment? And then you can break that down into the two types of selection I talked about before. Is there selection for endomorphs as male mimics? And is there negative frequency dependent selection on more? So, I tried to get at this using a big behavior study. We went out to the, like, into the wild where these populations are, and we took a male, an endomorph, and a gynomorph for each trial, and glued them down in perching positions around the edge of the pools where they meet. Um, so these are live damselflies, just their legs are glued down, so they can still move their wings, their abdomens, they just can't fly away. And then we would step away, and we would observe the behavior of other males in the population towards these vocal animals. We recorded their behavior and counted specific things like um, approaching within a certain distance, physical contact, getting, attempting to get into that tandem position, and calculations. So I'm just going to play you a quick interaction so that you can see what I'm talking about. So a male might come in, approach an endomorph but not contact her, and then approach and contact the guy more. Then he might go into tandem with her, and then they might populate. So we counted up how many times each of those behaviors occurred. We also timed them, so we have a sense of how long um, these individuals are being interacted with. Each trial lasted for an hour, and we did this with 192 individuals in five different populations. Those five different populations had very different frequencies of this andromorph trait, ranging from essentially all gynomorph to almost all andromorph females. But first I want to show you that data pooled 
together to test that first hypothesis that anamorphs are in general male mammals, because that assumes that it doesn't depend on the frequency of the trait in the population. So this is the expected pattern if this hypothesis is correct. We expect that males are harassed, presumably least, anamorphs potentially a little more if the mimicry isn't perfect, but definitely gynomorphs will be harassed more than anamorphs. That's the pattern, and then this is the real data. This is just the number of approaches within a certain distance. So there's no difference in how often males approach either. There's no difference between the morphs, but there's also no difference between the sexes. Males approach the males just as often as they approach the females. And the other thing to point out is that the typical values here are pretty low, only a couple of approaches per hour. Um, so that was only approaches, but maybe they behave differently after they've approached. So we can look at the total number of interactions. And we see the same pattern. There's no difference in how often the males interact between the morphs or even between the sexes. And then we could also look at the overall time that these interactions lasted. Again, there's no difference in the typical values. So statistically, there's no difference. But visually, you might say, like, oh, there, there are a lot more high outliers for the females than the males. And those, if you break down the data, are all from tandems. Those are when males came in, grabbed the focal, the focal females, and just held on sometimes just until the end of the trial, you see one that lasted more than 50 minutes. They can't really do that to other males very well, the class just don't fit. So that's why we see the difference between the sexes. But I'll point out that there doesn't seem to be a difference between the morphs. So even if that does impose fitness costs, which it makes sense that someone hanging onto your neck would impose fitness costs, um, it doesn't look like there's a difference between the morphs. So we didn't really find any evidence for this general idea that animorphs will be harassed less because they're male mimics, but maybe that's because that we're pulling all the data from the different populations together. So if we break the populations apart, we might expect to see this pattern of the frequency dependence. If you line the populations up in order of the percentage of anamorphs in that population, you expect that as you go along that climb, there'd be less harassment of the anamorphs and more harassment of the anamorphs. So that's the pattern that we expect, and then here's the pattern that we see. This is a uh, number of interactions, but we got essentially the same lack of pattern for all of the other variables. There's no, there's no sort of crosswise interaction here. There's no interaction term between the frequency of the population and the effect that it has on harassment. There is, um, the frequency term does pop out as, as significant. That's primarily due to this population at the end here. Um, but that population you can see, it just has higher rates of interaction for everyone. We think that that's because the distribution of habitat in that population is different, it's more restricted. So it might be that there's just sort of a higher interaction density. But regardless of why that is, we definitely don't see that interaction term occurring. So we don't really see evidence for this negative frequency dependent selection on more. So yeah, to conclude, harassment was pretty equal both between the morphs and even between the sexes. We didn't really see any evidence for male mimicry or any evidence for density dependent selection. So we have to conclude that we just don't have any evidence that female color is under selection from harassment. In the species. But I don't want to leave it there. I want to talk a little bit about why that we think we see this and what else could be going on. So why do we see this result in this species when in plenty of other species we have seen both of these patterns? One possible explanation is that Ishnura, the genus that I showed you before, and the other genera that have been studied, they all have non-territorial males that find mates through what's called scramble competition. This is really just males mobbing the this, that there are very high rates of interaction. So one study found 20 tandems in an hour. But the species that I study, the males are territorial. They stick to like a small portion of the bank of one pool, and they roam around it, but they don't really go out after females. So if females don't want to interact with males, they can just avoid those territories. So this leads to pretty low rates of interaction. We have 0.4 tandems per hour, which is two orders of magnitude lower than in that other species. So it may be that the importance of harassment is species specific, depending on the natural history of that species. And in our species, it just isn't that important in determining female fitness. But there's another factor, there's another explanation that could be going on for why females are dimorphic, and that's habitat use. The anamorphs and the gynomorphs <coughs> use their habitat differently. Specifically, the anamorphs are out in more male-like habitat, out of the pools, while the gynomorphs are in the vegetation. So if they're in different parts of their habitat, they could be experiencing different selection pressures just from being there. And that could be what's driving
describing the color evolution. It might have fairly little to do with mating choice. So my advisor has been studying this for a while. We have a lot of correlational evidence suggesting that this might be the case, that this might be under natural, that this trait might be under natural selection. Um, I'm going to be trying to measure that selection directly this summer, so stay tuned for updates. But yeah, for now, that's what we think is going on. And we, we can certainly say that it doesn't seem to be sexual selection. So I'd like to thank the undergrads who helped with this work and the NSF for funding it. And I'll take your questions. Similar question. Um, you said that the two female morphs inhabit different territories. So where did you glue them down? We all we glue them all around the pools because that's where all of them come to mate. They spend so they spend their time in different places, but they all come to mate around those pools. Yeah. Did you see aggressive behaviors between the um, incoming male and the male that was glued down? These these are territorial males. Yeah, it gets. I think it gets really easy to sort of uh, project what you think is like sexual versus aggressive just because it's two males versus two females. Um, I can say that the males would sometimes try to get into tandem with the males just like they would try to get into tandem with the females. So it doesn't seem like they were interacting. They weren't always interacting differently with males. 